All right, so I can see some more people still filtering in, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Everything is recording and it is available live on Facebook. We are streaming there on the National Center for Autonomous Technologies uh, webpage there on Facebook. Um, so good morning uh, or afternoon. Uh, this, my name is Zach Nicklin, and I am a co-PI and the director of UAS for the National Center for Autonomous Technologies. Uh, welcoming you to our uh, another webinar in our Think Autonomous series. Um, today, we've got uh, a couple of great guests from the FAA, and we're going to be talking about public aircraft operations and the certificate of authorization process. Uh, just wanted to mention the National Center for Autonomous Technologies uh, is hosting this event, and if you do go to our website, our webpage, uh, ncatech.org, you can scroll down to the bottom and go to member login and join us there for all the latest news and updates about events and curriculum and resources all around autonomous technology. So with me today, I've got Diana Robinson from the FAA. She's a project specialist with AUS 410. And then I've got Stephen Pansky. Stephen Pansky is a senior aviation analyst uh, working under contract with AUS 430, correct, sir? That is correct, yes. All right, and I see we also got uh, Alina George joined us, and Alina is another one of our, our great representatives from the FAA, and they're going to be helping us out today. So, uh, Diana, I'll go ahead and, uh, and toss it over to you. Thank you, Zach, and yes, if you're If you're not a member of NCAP, please go to news uh, related to a new initiative called Connected by Drones, which is a local government networking group. Uh, this webinar kind of spun off from that. There was a concern about the whole uh, public aircraft operations and, and COA process. And I actually, I'm so delighted that Steve is going to be presenting today. I met him before coming to the FAA, which was a little over a year ago. I was with the local government, and as we were trying to stand up our UAS program, I was having the hardest time understanding the difference in the PAO code process, as well as uh, those that had our Part 107 remote Oh, pilot license, because in my mind, and Steve, I thought this would be good for you to know, I'm convinced I had a mental block that it was, we are a public entity, we want to just fly and do our thing. <laughs> but that's not how it works. And so he's going to share a little bit uh, about that with you today. So keep an open mind, don't block like I did. Um, and Steve, thanks so much. Sure. Absolutely. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen with everybody here. And uh, if I can find my uh, presentation, which I can here. All right, Steve, as you bring that up, I just want to let everybody know there are some great people from the FAA that are going to be working uh, in the background. So in the chat or in the Q&A section, if you have questions, please go ahead and, and write them out there. And there's a, a team standing by waiting to answer questions. Great, I appreciate that, and uh, and again, uh, exactly, I appreciate the opportunity to come in today and speak on behalf of uh, the FAA. A real quick background about myself: uh, I, uh, as as was mentioned on the uh, on the introduction, I'm with Science Applications International Corporation (SAIC), uh, and I've been supporting the uh, UAS integration program here for about uh, gosh darn it, August will be 11 years. I've been doing this as a contractor, but prior to that. I, uh, I do have an FAA background. I had uh, 24 and a half years with the FAA and Air Traffic Organization. Uh, prior to that, I was with uh, Public Safety uh, for a period of time. Uh, and I left the FAA back in uh, 2002, and, uh, and I went over to, um, to the Department of Homeland Security, and I was a federal security director in Northern Nevada, where I uh, stood up the program there for TSA and the screening of, uh, of uh, passengers and your personal effects and also the infrastructure in Northern Nevada all, on all air modes of transportation for, uh, for TSA and the Department of Homeland Security. And then I retired. And as I mentioned, they, uh, I got a call back from the FAA and said, we'd like you to maybe come back and join us as a contractor and, uh, and uh, support the, uh, the FAA program because you have a law enforcement background, you have an air traffic control background and we need some help because uh, we found out that public safety speaks a different language than the FAA does, and they were having difficulty at, at times trying to communicate with one another. And so they asked me to come in and support that effort. They also gave me a little bit of carte blanche to allow me to lean forward, if you will, to help support public safety and allowing them to 
gain access into the NAS to provide uh, greater access to conduct operations using small unmanned aircraft. And uh, for, for lack of better words, they probably made a mistake in allowing me to lean forward because we leaned a lot way forward when we started the program and it got the program moving down the road. But that being said, my 11 years really has been really involved around a lot of dealing with public safety and allowing them access. And so I've got uh, quite a bit of history, uh, history with, the, uh, with the program. And normally what happens is we get the, a series of questions that are almost always asked of us about uh, operating as a public aircraft operator versus operating under part 107. And also questions about, uh, you know, what uh, can I legally do or I cannot do and what will work best for my agency. So these are typically the kinds of questions that are always asked of us. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is I'll walk through these questions and give you sort of my best answer if I can. Unfortunately, a lot of times the answers turn out to be sometimes it all depends. And of course, it all depends, really depends upon what you're looking for, what your plan mission is going to be and what you're going to be doing, but we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the program. But what I'd like to sort of start off, if you don't mind, is, is this sort of put a little, uh, put this all a little into perspective, because I know typically the audience can vary from people who have a lot of experience. They're not only part 107 operators, but they also hold other uh, types of uh, aviation certifications like uh, private pilots and commercial and air transport ratings, and they have a lot of experience and they understand the NAS quite a bit. And then on the other end of the spectrum, unfortunately, we have a lot of folks that are just starting off and they're trying to understand what is this all about? What, is this, what does this all mean? I wanna go out there and I wanna fly my unmanned aircraft and I wanna support my, my agency and I wanna do that, but what can I legally do? What can I not do? What is, what is this thing called the NAS? What does it all mean? So I wanna just take a few slides here, sort of put this in perspective for you is what it is. Unlike uh, uh, public agencies that really are segregated or set up, based upon the footprint or the size of their cities, the size of their counties, or in some cases, state agencies, and we're dealing with federal agencies, responsibility across the entire United States and, and onwards. The, the FAA really sets the airspace up based upon classifications of airspace. So a lot of times the footprint of what the uh, class of airspace is could very well contain, be contained within not just one city, but several cities and that expansion footprint then falls out and sometimes it falls over to other states. So in other words, the FAA doesn't really classify their airspace based upon a jurisdictional kind of footprint of we have to remain within the size of a city or, a, or the size of, our, of a county as far as those um, jurisdictional boundaries, their classification is really set up based upon the complexity of the airspace. And that's how we do this is controlling airplanes. The, the, not, the, the areas that are not really that complex, the class G airspace, we typically can sometimes provide advisory services to pilots that wanna operate there, but normally we classify it as uncontrolled uh, or because simply uh, we're really providing services to those locations where the complexity of the airspace is such that we have to provide really uh, uh, positive control to, uh, to pilots and aircraft to allow them to egress and regress into controlled airspace. So if you look at this uh, diagram here real quickly, uh, what you'll see is class G airspace is sort of like in that uncontrolled area. But then when you look at class Delta, uh, surface class Echo, class Charlie, class Bravo airspace, these are all sort of complexity based upon, as I mentioned, the volume of aircraft that are going into out of the airspace, the types of aircraft and the complexity of the airspace typically to egress and regress down from higher altitudes and descending. So when we talk about upside down wedding cakes, that's really what we're talking about, a bigger expansion on top where we're capturing some of the high performance aircraft and the air carrier type aircraft. And we're basically working them down into and landing at the, uh, at the airports. And, and conversely, when they depart, we're providing them protection as they climb out into higher altitudes. You also notice up there class A airspace, that's from uh, uh, 18,000 feet, or as we say flight level 180 up to flight level 600. And, uh, and that's the airspace, which is also positive control where if you're operating that airspace, the FAA is knows everybody that's in there and they're separating everybody and in that airspace is what they're doing. So this is basically what that sort of airspace looks like. So as I mentioned before, unlike uh, a city or a county that has a jurisdictional kind of footprint, this is the kind of way we break it up. 
unfortunately, we don't depict it this way in these cartoons. This is what typically what the what the VFR sectional maps look like. So one of the challenges you have as a new operator or somebody who's operating the National Airspace System is to understand how to understand these types of maps so you can understand the airspace and the locations where you'll be able to operate under the conditions and provisions of whatever the program it is you're going to operate under or those areas where you're, you're going to need approval from the FAA to be able to operate. This happens to be a depiction of a VFR sectional map in Northern California. Off to the left there is the San Francisco area in class Bravo airspace and your works away across out to the east side of the uh, uh, from that location. As you can see, it goes from a very complex operation to somewhat uh, not so complex to a lot of open airspace. So this is typically a, the kinds of diagrams you'll see across the nation and depending on the airspace you're operating and what it's going to look like. Well, there is typically about six different types of ways you operate your unmanned aircraft. And these are the typical ones. Today, we're going to obviously cover the Part 107 uh, rule and, and operating under Part 107, as well as public aircraft operations. But there are a few others there that people are operating under. Under uh, 44807 exemptions, these are civil operators that are typically operating aircraft that weigh more than 55 pounds. They can't operate under the 107 rule. So they'll operate under an exemption from the FAA and the Department of Transportation. And then they'll receive a certificate of authorization or a COA from the air traffic organization to operate a specific location where they're going to conduct their operations. Below that, there's an experimental program. This allows basically uh, uh, experimental civil operators to operate airplanes for the purposes of research and development, for market survey, for um, demonstration flights, and for pilot training. Those are the areas that they can operate within. And they'll be issued an airworthiness certificate. And then again, we will issue them, we being the air traffic uh, organization, will issue them a COA or, or a COA to operate uh, within specific operating location. There's a type certificated aircraft program where we go ahead and they, they go in and, and they'll uh, run through the process of issuing a type certificate to a pilot. And there's, a, uh, there's also an operation uh, where uh, you as a recreational operator, 44809 program, uh, where you can operate and you basically are operating under community-based uh, organizational standards or, or CBO standards as they are as a recreational operator. And this is also changing too today. There's uh, the, the um, recreational operators uh, under a new program called Trust will be now be giving some uh, an opportunity to learn a little bit about the national airspace system when they operate and it'll give them a little more uh, access to the NAS by the programs that are being developed here. So here's uh, typically six kinds of programs you could operate within. So let's talk a little bit about part 107. For the, uh, for, again, for the audience that's not familiar, under part 107, and you, when you uh, do have to pass a remote pilot's uh, certificate uh, training program, uh, you'll be operating an unmanned aircraft weighing less than 55 pounds. The operations are typically at or below 400 feet. Uh, they're operated uh, which, within visual line of sight of the aircraft. Um, you can only operate one aircraft at a time. Uh, normally it's daytime operations, but just, uh, just recently under the uh, new remote ID program uh, with the new uh, knowledge uh, recurrence training that you take, you're now going to be authorized to fly night operations in the Part 107. So that opens up quite a bit of uh, access to the NAS for the Part 107 pilots. And also, as we move forward, there's also the opportunity under a declaration of compliance program that's uh, underway right now, where hopefully uh, when manufacturers are able to identify um, aircraft that meet a level of safety standards, uh, you'll be able to operate over people also as a Part 107 operator. So that's on the horizon. It's coming really quickly here. But besides that, the rest of it is visual line of sight of the aircraft. And if you need to operate within restricted, or I'm sorry, within controlled airspace, that's not the Class G, but the Class Delta, Surface Class Echo, Class Charlie, or Class Bravo airspace, uh, you would then be able to uh, get approval through Part 107 by either using the low altitude author authorization and notification capability program. It's called Lance, which is a smart app that you upload uh, onto your smartphone or your tablet and you can get approval immediately to fly in controlled airspace. Or you can still use our drone zone uh, web portal to be able to go in and apply for an approval to operate within controlled airspace for those locations where the Lance program is not authorizing you to fly. So that's typically what the 107 program looks like. But as a public aircraft operator, it's a little different. 
instead of uh, taking an examination and passing uh, a remote pilot uh, requirement for you, as a public aircraft operator, you're operating under Part 91, FAR, Federal Air Regulations Part 91, and you're operating under a COA or a certificate of authorization to conduct the operations. We have two types of COAs that we issue to public agencies. One, one is called a blanket area COA. This is for all operations in Class G airspace across the CONUS of the United States, which means that you have the same access as you would under Part 107 um, uh, for conducting missions. However, under the COA as a public aircraft operator, you also get a few extra things. You automatically get day and night operations uh, as part of your approved COA. Um, and then you're also gonna get what's called limited flight over people for life-saving events. The determination was made that since uh, public agencies for the most part are conducting operations that are for law enforcement and firefighting, uh, those types of operations inherently are gonna require uh, operations that may be need to be conducted over people or property, such as a collapsed building where you wanna get your aircraft low enough to be able to survey the, uh, the, uh, the area there. Uh, so the inherently, it was felt that uh, being able to provide them with that access was a necessity. So that was built into the COA as part of that approval for limited flight over people for life-saving events. Uh, there's also a, a, another program that we just started off and we'll talk about a little bit later on, and that's called Tactical Beyond Visual on a Site, where you'll actually be able to fly beyond the visibility of the aircraft for a limited amount of time to conduct, again, life-saving missions. And we've also offered that up for those uh, public agencies that are currently holding COAs and want to go and get an additional tactical beyond the line of sight approval. There's about 145 agencies right now that have signed up for that program that have been approved for that operation. Uh, for the blanket area, typically because we don't have a uh, requirement to do any coordination with an air traffic control uh, facility because it's Class G, it takes us about five business days to process that approval for that COA uh, once you've submitted a good application into our program called the COA Application Online Processing System. Uh, the other type of COA we have is called a ju uh, jurisdictional COA. Unlike the, uh, the Class G COA, the jurisdictional COA is identified by a footprint of the size of the operating area you're normally going to be operating your aircraft in. So if you're, if you're going to be the size of your city, or the size of your county or possibly multiple counties where you have a responsibility and you're going to be responding there all the time, then the jurisdictional COA would probably be a good uh, direction for you to go because you probably have controlled airspace there and the COA will actually identify within the, uh, co uh, within the document the provisions that you'll comply with to be able to operate within controlled airspace. It's different than Lance because Lance uses that app, as I mentioned earlier, the COA itself identifies the operational way you're gonna be approved to fly within controlled airspace. And because the operations uh, in jurisdictional area typically are involving air traffic control facilities that have to be coordinated with, it takes a little bit longer to process those it's really dependent upon the complexity of the operational area that you're going to be want to operate within. But normally about 30 to 45 business days is what it takes for us to process a jurisdictional COA. Again, it's a first come first serve basis where their COAs are processed. We have three locations around the country where our processing COAs right now today. That's in Seattle for the Western service area, uh, Fort Worth, uh, Texas for the central and then the Eastern areas, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where they're processing them. And of course, depending on how busy they are, will be could, could very well drive the timeline it takes to process those COAs. The third way down there, you'll see there, it says special governmental interest. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later here in my presentation, but if at all, if, if at some time you cannot get access into the NASA to fly and it's for a very specific time of uh, emergency type of situation, there is a way for us, the FAA, to be able to approve that operation for you under a special governmental interest or an SGI approval through the FAA System Operations Support Center. Again, we'll talk about that in just a, a few minutes about that. So the next question always is, am I qualified to operate as a public aircraft operator? And of course, before I usually talk about this, I always like to make sure you know, we understand that when you operate, whatever program you're operating under, you have to really operate under the conditions and provisions of that specific program. So if you are operating under Part 107 and you hold a remote pilot airman certificate, you are operating under the rules of 14 CFR Part 107 and all the rules that apply with that. 
If you're operating as a public aircraft operator, and this is to the public agency that we issue the COA to, not an individual pilot or pilots, the pilots or pilots under the COA are operating under the, under the public agency who has the, uh, the public uh, declaration letter, uh, I'm sorry, has the, has the COA issued to them. Um, those type of operations you're conducting under the specific operating provisions and conditions of the COA itself and under rules of FAR Part 91. So the important thing to understand really is that uh, they're mutually exclusive, meaning that you can't combine the two programs together and make one program of your own that takes the best of all of them and, and operate under that. You have to make a conscious decision before you fly to say that, look, it, if my pilots hold Part 107 certificates, and I also have a COA to operate as a blanket COA, and I also have another COA to operate under a jurisdictional, and by the way, you can hold more than one COA. The, the only understanding you have to have is before I fly the airplane, I make a decision which program am I flying under, and I'll fly under the conditions and provisions of that specific COA, because each one of the rules and the operating conditions are slightly different, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're operating under the legal rules of what are that program's going to be. So moving forward here, how do I qualify or is my public agency qualified to operate as a public aircraft operator? Well, there's four basic uh, criteria that you have to meet to be able to operate as a public aircraft operator. First of all, your agency must be a political subdivision of your state. Each state constitution, I can tell you right now, is slightly written differently and they identify each one of their agencies, whether it be their cities or their counties or their uh, parishes or their townships or their villages or whatever they're calling their entities or the, how they made up their states. They're all usually classified within their constitutions under some sort of sat statutory citation that addresses how that they are qualified to operate as a political subdivision of their state. And so the first criteria that has to be met is that your agency actually meets that criteria. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of public agencies out there that do not qualify because their states don't recognize them. We have a real challenge a lot of times with the volunteer fire departments across the country because they are basically operating in the best interest of their communities and the taxes that are being collected on behalf of them to pay for the salaries and to pay for the equipment and whatever are really not really recognized in the state's constitution. And so as such, that becomes problematic and, and a lot of fire agencies that are volunteer cannot operate as public aircraft operators. So they're operating under part 107. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later too because everything you wanna do as a public agency, you can do under part 107. There's no requirement for you if you are a public agency to have to operate as a public aircraft operator, you can definitely operate under part 107. So the first criteria is you must have uh, be a political subdivision of the state. The second criteria is that you as a public agency must either own or must have the aircraft leased to you for a minimum of 90 days with exclusive rights to the aircraft. So if you're planning on operating as a public aircraft operator and you're uh, operating with your own personal aircraft in support of an operation for your city or your county or your public agency, and this is what you're gonna qualify and operate under, you're gonna probably have to enter into an agreement with your public agency and give them exclusive rights to your aircraft because as the criteria says there, you have to be uh, either own it or lease it to that. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's described under 49 USC 40102A41C, which speaks to owning the aircraft, and 41D that speaks to the leasing of aircraft in the, in the criteria. The third one is the operations cannot be for commercial use or compensation or higher, and that's uh, 49 USC 40125B, as in Bravo, and that means that you cannot be reimbursed from specifically for the kinds of operations that you be conducting for other people. This becomes a little difficult and problematic a lot of times with uh, FEMA because FEMA likes to pay for services when they call people out to do that. And as a public agency, you're not gonna be able to directly be reimbursed for that as a public operator. So it's problematic to be able to do that when you're collecting, when you're receiving money from a federal agency. Uh, and the fourth uh, criteria, which is the one we're probably gonna spend a little bit of time on. And this is that the missions you're gonna conduct as a public agency must meet the definition of a governmental function. So the next question always is, is well, what is, what's a governmental function? Well, this is the definition, as you can see there, it's very narrow in description is what it says. It says uh, national defense, intelligence, firefighting, search and rescue, law enforcement, 
aeronautical uh, research or biological geological resource management. And that's the extension of the definition uh, of what a governmental function is. The FAA legal office has come out and given us some guidance that says there are a lot of things that public agencies want to do that you would think would be inherently a governmental function. However, that is not necessarily the case is what it is. Because of that narrow definition, they've identified several items. And as you can see on this list and the next page, there are items there that possibly your agency is going to be doing that you want to operate as a public operator and frank, and you will not qualify. In other words, you'll qualify to get the COA as a public aircraft operator, but you won't be able to conduct the mission that you want to fly because it doesn't meet the definition of a governmental function. The important ones here that I like to underline all the times in that second one, there is a real interesting one because training and preparation for conducting public aircraft operations. So a lot of times you would think, I want to train all my people to be able to fly my aircraft before I take them out there and actually fly missions for my public agency. The FAA has said that training is inherently not a governmental function, which means that you won't be able to train under the COA to prepare and fly your mission. So the next question is, well, how do I do that? Or, or why am I concerned about that? Because uh, as a public aircraft operator, there are several things you can do as a public aircraft operator and, and, and as far as training and certification of pilots that are not, that have to be in compliance with, let's say, the 107 rule. One of them is the certification of your pilots. And again, I have another slide here that I'll talk a little more detail about this. But one of the issues here is that you don't have to hold a Part 107 certificate to operate as a public aircraft operator. You can do your own training and certification of your pilots. And that may seem very enticing to a lot of public agencies to want to do that because uh, you don't have to go and, and, and enter all the expense of going out and getting all this training necessary and then go and pay the $150, $160 to take the initial training exam to pass uh, to get your Part 107 certificate. So if you have a half a dozen pilots in your agency that you want to train, that could be a substantial savings is what it could be. However, the problem with that would be is that you can only fly missions that meet the definition of a governmental function. And as you can see by this list here, one of them being training, you won't be able to train your pilots is what it is because you can't train under that. The other one here, uh, very important to understand is that any kind of state owned utility inspections or any kind of work like that would not be covered under the uh, governmental function definition, in which case you wouldn't be able to fly the missions of that. So you have to take a real close look when you start to decide is, is, a, is a public, um, uh, operating as a public aircraft uh, operation uh, under a COA, is it really right for my AC or is it going to serve my purposes is what it's going to be. So that's important to understand that when you're trying to decide if this is right for me or not, if it's not right for me. Uh, so what program will best work for my agency? And so you get really got to take a look at that question that I just asked there a second ago. So Steve, just, just for clarification quick. Um, so if we, if we go back to, to what is allowed, it, it said aviation uh, research and it said uh, uh, public resource management, correct? If you go back, back about two slides. This way. Yeah, one more, there you go. Uh, okay, so, so biological, geological resource management and aeronautical research. So if it falls yes. outside of that, uh, even if it is collaborative research with a, with a nonprofit, uh, then, it, then it would not fit under the COA process. That is correct. It would not fit under the COA process. That is correct. And oh, by the way, if you're, uh, we talk about aeronautical research, we're talking about basically designing aircraft. But once the aircraft is designed, it no longer becomes a governmental function, even though you're flying it. So that becomes problematic. And so you'll need another means of flying. And again, if the aircraft weighs less than 55 pounds, the Part 107 rule is the way to go. If the aircraft weighs more than 55 pounds, then the 44807 exemption that I mentioned earlier would be the direction you're going to want to go in to be able to get approval to be able to fly those kinds of aircraft is what it is. All right, great. And so just a okay. caveat for, for one of our, our folks that asked a question there um, that, that was a member of a community college, uh, I'd say to be very, very careful, even if you had a COA and were operating under it, uh, as far as insurance and things like that goes, uh, it's, it's always best to have your, your Part 107 if you can fly under that. Um, just just for insurance purposes, I know in the community college system, uh, we, we like to make sure that our that our operations are uh, can, can fall under our insurance and, and cover us there. So. Sure, absolutely. So continue on with this. Uh, the several th uh, questions that you you're going to be asking yourself as an agency before I decide what direction I'm going to go. 
and, and I'll be honest with you, what we normally tell people, and I'll repeat this probably two or three times during the rest of this presentation is, Normally, uh, when people ask, well, what's the best direction for me to go? Well, if you can qualify as a public aircraft operator and there will be missions that you want to conduct for your agency that are going to fall within that definition, then more than then go ahead and, and apply for a COA as a public aircraft operator. However, we also recommend why limit yourself to that? Take every tool that you can put in your toolbox and go ahead and, and uh, uh, apply for it. So, Yes, go ahead and get your Pilots 107 certificated so you can use that. And whatever air, whatever's going to get your aircraft and your operation airborne the quickest, that's the program you're going to want to operate under. So we have a lot of public safety agencies out there that are operating uh, not only under COAS, but they operate a lot under Part 107 to get their user operations. But when they need to use the uh, COA for a specific operation, that's when they'll bring it out of their toolbox and they'll start to operate with it. So when we start to talk about different types of pros and cons, this is sort of a sort of a limited kind of list of the kinds of things you might want to look at uh, when you're talking about that. There, like I say, there's some advantages to operating as a public operator. I mentioned it before that before <laughs> the new remote uh, uh, ID order came out, night operations was always given. Of course, now as a 107, and you can get night operations as part of your uh, Part 107 licensing and your uh, and your, re your recurrence uh, training knowledge. Then it's not so much an advantage anymore on that side. However. There's still some advantages of operations over people for life scene event that the COA will provide you to get you access into that. Uh, this tactical beyond visual line of sight will be another positive for public agencies that are responding to those types of operations that uh, need assistance. Uh, so th that's another one. And again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes about that one. However, there are some negatives to operating as a public aircraft operator. There is a NOTAM requirement. And for those of you that are not familiar, a notice to airmen is a uh, a requirement that you actually file with the FAA to advise them where you're going to be operating your aircraft. What this does is it get, provides information to general aviation pilots that in fact there is an UAS operation taking place at a specific location. So it gives them sort of, sort of an idea that in fact when they're, when they're flying around in the system they can do and they can review the NOTAM uh, information out there and they can determine where po potentially low flying aircraft are going to be at. So they want to possibly try to avoid those operating air areas when they're flying their, their aircraft around the system. Um, uh, for the, uh, there's also some requirements in there that uh, does limit, obviously the governmental function does limit you the types of operations you can fly under the public uh, declaration. So for those air, uh, public agencies that have made the determination that they only want to uh, only want to self-train their pilots and not uh, uh, comply with the uh, with a, a 107 remote pilot license uh, then they are very limited to the types of operations they want to conduct and the example I always give them is that when the uh, when the boss says I want to take the UAS down to the local schoolyard and do a demonstration flight for the local kids on the types of equipment we're utilizing for our public agency and and fly it for them you're going to have to tell your boss you can't fly it under the COA because it doesn't authorize you demonstration flights or public relation type flights. It's not a governmental function that's identified. As such, you'll have to operate under Part 107. So again, an advantage there to hold the 107 license. So what we typically tell a lot of, of uh, public agencies is that go ahead and certify your pilots under Part 107, and but use the COA process to operate under uh, for your public operation and your, and your 107 is your training and certification you're using to tell the FAA that you have a training and certification program in place. And that's how you go about do that. So you then open yourself up to be able to operate at really at, uh, at almost all the operational locations you want to conduct the operations at. So you have, you have both of them is what it is. Again, if in fact you don't perceive your agency needing uh, to operate as a public aircraft operator, because you're probably not going to find too many of those operations where you need to operate as a public operator or an advantage to that, then I would say probably it might not be worth your effort to go down that road to go in and apply for uh, approval to fly as a public air operator. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a little hint here uh, uh, in a few minutes here that in fact, as a part 107 operator, you can actually get those approvals anyway. And I'll explain that to you in a few minutes here, how you go about doing that. Um, a couple of additional advantages, obviously, is operating as a civil operator is that, um, is that uh, there's significantly less re kind of reporting requirements for you to do as a civil operator. Uh, there's no question about compensation and hire for your agencies. Uh, don't have to worry about proprietary data being released uh, and whatever as a, as a civil operator. Um, 
And the important one down there is obviously you can do all the training you need to do under Part 107, and you're not constricted or restrained from being able to do that as a public aircraft operator. So the question that we always get asked by everybody is, and that's the one we I referenced to earlier, is that, well, I heard from other agencies that if I operate as a public aircraft operator, I don't need to have a pilot's license, do I? And the answer is yes, that is true. You don't have to hold a remote pilot's license. However, this is the old thing, but answer is what it is. And the answer is, there's a lot of things you have to do as a public aircraft operator because you take on all the liability as the public agency responsibility for ensuring that you're meeting a left safety a level of safety equivalent to that of, of other people that are operating the national airspace system. So that's just a list down there that you're gonna develop again, your own training certification programs. You're gonna to have to establish any kind of recurrency training that you have you are certifying the airworthiness of the aircraft. The FAA is not giving any type of certificate. Uh, airworthiness certificate for your aircraft is what they're not doing that. Uh, you have to have your own medical certification for your pilots, which means you're going to develop a program for that. And you also have to develop and some, uh, establish some kind of a duty time restriction policy. And what that means is that you have to determine how, much, how long you allow your pilots to fly before you have to give them rest periods and how much time they can fly you know, between a long period of time before they have to be able to operate again. So the FAA sets up those standards for pilots that are operating under Part 61. Under the public operation, you set those standards. So you may think that, in fact, oh, this is a great deal to fly as a public operator because I really don't have to follow a lot of the rules and have the requirements of the FAA. However, you take on as a public agency the liability for all of that, which means you really do have to develop programs and you also have to take on that liability if something were to happen and, and you end up in a court of law, I think maybe the least of your, your concerns are going to be maybe the FAA, your concerns will be the attorney standing across from you at the table there who's asking you questions about your training program and your, uh, and your uh, airworthiness program and your medical certification program and all those other questions they may ask of you. So it's something to consider as part of that as you're, when you're making a consideration of when you're going to fly or not going to fly. And awesome. so, hey, Stephen, um, yeah, go ahead. We've, we've got some questions about the uh, the 5322 rule that was mentioned yes. a couple slides back. Uh, if you can just give an overview of uh, what sure, that I'm sorry. Is. Let me let me talk a second about that. One of the provisions that's located in the in the current blanket COA says that you cannot operate any closer than five nautical miles to a controlled uh, airport, uh, any closer than three nautical miles to an uncontrolled airport. Uh, with a published instrument approach or no closer than two nautical miles to any other airport or heliport that may be operating. And that's in the blanket COA. So in essence, even though you have a blanket COA that's authorizing you to fly within class G airspace, if, some, if you were to uh, conduct an operation and you are closer than that 5322 location to those, you then would need to have an approval to be able to operate. The COA would not authorize you to fly that. So in essence, what you would have to do is make a call to the System Operations Support Center, the SOSC. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. And we will, and you'll have to ask them for approval to be able to fly that close to that location, to those locations uh, uh, under the under your approved COA, and they will give you an approval to be able to do that is what they'll have to do. More than likely, what they would ask you to do is contact the airport and let them know you're there, and then they would authorize the approval is what they would end up doing. But in those cases, the 5322 really is, is in there. And, and by the way, that, that rule came out back in the 2012 reauthorization language that came out when they actually put together the public, uh, um, uh, the public aircraft operational COAs that were, were written. They were the same restrictions that were actually placed on the 333 exemption operators back then who were given this blanket class G COA for their operations. Of course, when part 107 came out and that went away and it was no longer in there, unfortunately, the 5322 was still in there because you're operating under part 91, not under part 107, in which case that uh, still stands in place. So that's why it's still in there today. Hopefully that explains that. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So having said that, what if I can't fly under my COA under part 107, how do I get approval? So uh, there is a, a means for you to operate uh, under, uh, to operate at a lo location where you uh, need to operate, but because of the um, nature of either the COA that you've uh, been issued that doesn't authorize you to fly, let's say too close to a controlled airport or under, under the part 107 where you are uh, operating under the uh, 
approval uh, process of Lance and you cannot um, operate within too close to an airport. And the nature of the operation is that you need to fly right away. It's not something you can go to a drone zone and apply for an approval uh, for an operation that may take several, several days to get published. Um, uh, in those situations where you need to fly, and here's a, here's a pretty good list that the, uh, the System Operations Support Center puts out of the types of things that you can give them a call and ask for approval to do. And there's some utility and infrastructure restoration work in there that really falls, uh, that really falls outside of what you normally would think about as firefighting, search, rescue, and law enforcement type operations. But in these types of situations where you need that approval, you can call the SOSC, even if you're a Part 107 operator, if you're doing work that uh, requires you to do some of this restoration work or damage assessments of infrastructure that you need to do right away, you can call the SOSC and uh, they can authorize an approval for you to get that approval to go ahead and fly that type of mission for them. So even though you think that you need to operate as a public aircraft operator because you need that access, you need to get in there and do those things that normally you can't get approval to under 107. There is a way under 107 to be able to also get those types of approvals and this is what it is. And basically what this uh, turns out to be is that, uh, again, if you're flying into part 107 and you need the additional operational uh, access and, and, uh, and flexibility to get access, if you wanna fly within a TFR in support of a mission there, that's another way you can get in and do that operations. Uh, or if, like I mentioned before, you need to get into controlled airspace and operate, it's a simple one phone call uh, to the SOSC. Um, and uh, there is a small one page um, uh, email that you'll have to send to them which gives them the specific uh, operating location, the latitude and longitude coordinates where you wanna operate. And they'll do all the coordination for you is what they'll do. So in a situation where in the example of uh, you're getting called out to go into another county or go out to uh, maybe another state in support of a, of a, a search and rescue or a uh, or a, uh, an incident involving a natural disaster where there, there may be calling in additional teams to help support one another. If you go and evaluate the airspace and determine that, oh, wait a second, it's, it's controlled airspace. I don't have an authorization, authorization to do that under, under the part 107. And I don't have an authorization under either my COAS to do that. You can call the SOSC and by the time you get there, they will have given you approval to go ahead and fly the mission. In fact, depending on the nature and the complexity and the, uh, of the of the event and something that's eminent kind of operations, they have the authorization to go ahead and give you immediate approval, and they'll let you know the paperwork's to follow. But go ahead and fly the mission, and they actually are on they are uh, on the phone. They're talking to the uh, either the air traffic control tower or the uh, radar approach control facility, and they're letting them know that this is where you're at and you're operating mission. And if necessary, uh, based upon the nature of what that may be, such as maybe a, a, a fire event's broken out and you're, you're well ahead of what's going on there, they can start up a TFR and, and st basically sterilize the airspace if needed for some type of, a, of an emergency, not necessarily to allow you to go fly, but emergency where they really want to restrict manned aviation from, from flying over that location, whether it's be for looky-loos or whether it be for potential uh, emission, let's say, of a uh, of a, of a material that could be the, uh, be in, ingested into an aircraft or whatever they want to move airplanes out of the way of that, uh, then in fact they can stand up TFRs right away. So they have the ability to do that. They are basically the uh, voice of the administrator, the SOSC, and being able to manage the the airspace. And they're in direct contact, obviously, with the administrator when they're doing a lot of approvals and movements of uh, of uh, uh, and movements and uh, and approvals of airspace in the in the system is what it is. And Stephen, just for your clarification, the SOSC, are they staffed 24-7? Yeah, good. SOSC, System Operations Sports Center, they are 24-7, 365-day uh, facility, although uh, between the hours of midnight, somebody gets to take home the telephone is what they get to do. So uh, uh, they have the ability and they have a computer and they can do everything from their home. But uh, right now, they're not staffing in a facility 24 hours, but there is somebody who answers the phone at any at any time is what they do, just to let Great you know. Great to know. Okay. All right, so what about this tactical beyond visual line of sight approval that we allow for public agencies right now? Um, this is a program that was started about six months ago, eight months ago, where uh, it was determined that a lot of times because of the nature of an event or whatever, where you want to move on a UAS into a position where you can't really have eyes on it. And of course, 
um, all your operations are done visual line of sight of your aircraft, but there may come a time when you need to operate the aircraft at a location where you cannot see it. And you frankly don't want to put a visual observer out there in harm's way in a location. Good examples are I have an over, overturned tanker truck that's emitting all kinds of chemical fumes. I'm not quite sure what it is that's emitting and I'm, and I'm not suited somebody up to go walk into this thing to try to take a look. I may take my unmanned air aircraft and fly it in there to take a sort of look all the way around the, 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 uh, the truck to see if I could capture the, uh, the labeling on the side of the truck to get an idea of what this chemical is that's being, ex ex being uh, flumed out. And I may put it in a position where I can't see the aircraft because it's behind a flume of smoke or whatever. Or the case of a structural fire where I want to come up the back side of the building and take a look. And I'm not going to put a visual observers out there potentially in harm's way because I'm looking at the uh, top of the roof to see if in fact I've got extra exposed building, I've got to structural potential damage for a collapse of the building. So a lot of times I'll put the aircraft be in some place where I want to be able to see it, but nobody can see the aircraft. So I am authorized under this tactical beyond visual on site to be able to authorize this kind of an operation uh, for the uh, approval of that beyond visual on site. The requirements are that you have to stay below a, a 400 foot solid ceiling. You have to can't exceed 1500 feet of from the operator of the unmanned aircraft where the ground control station is. And you have to be within 50 feet of the structure that you're actually flying behind or within is what it is. So there are some conditions and restrictions to this uh, type of an operation, but it does give them greater flexibility to allow them to tactically be able to operate. Today, it only is authorized for, uh, again, COA operators that are operating as public operators. They have not authorized this for part 107 operators, but a little secret for you, if you're a part 107 operator and you're supporting, let's say a fire agency, or you're supporting uh, some sort of an operation where this could be the case, you definitely can call the System Operations Support Center and let them know, hey, we're responding to this. We're gonna be needing to operate beyond visual line of sight uh, for a small period of time to be able to do an assessment. And we'd like to get approval under our 107 to do that. They can definitely approve that under a part 107. They can give you that authorization, that special governmental interest approval if you ask for it to do that. So again, as a part 107 operator, you're not gonna get an approval, a blanket approval, to go out there and do it every time, but you can use the part 107, uh, use the SOSC under part 107 to be able to go out and, and approve and ask for that. Kind so, of a, oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, actually, if you want to go back one slide here, uh, we just, just want to dig in a little deeper there. Uh, yep, this one here. Okay, so you said within 50 feet of the building, that's the aircraft within 50 feet of the top of the building with yes, that correct. hard line of 400 feet, correct? Exactly, yes. The exactly. operator is not required to be within 50 feet of the structure. No, 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 no. If, uh, if, uh, thanks for having to clarify that. Yeah, the operators, you don't want the operators that close to the building. Is what yes. <laughs> we want everybody to stand off away from the building is what we want them to do. And so the goal is that, and, and it's not funny, is that little picture drawing there looks like there's might be somebody standing on top of the roof up there. But that being said, no, that, they don't have to be on the roof. They don't have to do that. Yeah, the... Uh, the, re the restriction is for the aircraft is what it is. Yes, okay. Right? So let me stop right there and uh, and give you the, uh, the plug that if you have questions that we haven't answered today and uh, and you want to uh, uh, have answers to and, and, and uh, need answers to, the help desk at fa.gov is a great resource for, uh, for, uh, for everybody to utilize. They have a team of experts there that can answer your questions and Normally, if it has anything to do with public aircraft operations or whatever, they will forward those questions on to me and I'll be the ones that answers, uh, answer those questions. So yeah, one way or another, you can do that uh, and, uh, and that'll be great. And I think at the, uh, uh, if it didn't hear, my, uh, my email is, uh, is steven.ctr.pansky at fa.gov. Uh, if you wanna give me a, uh, an email call afterwards and I'll put it in the chat after we're, we're done here so you have that. And, uh, and if you want to uh, send me an email and ask me questions, feel free to do that. And then we can go ahead, Zach, and open up to any other questions anybody may have if we've got some time. Great, Stephen. Uh, tons of great, useful information. And, and there was questions uh, throughout that I think most of them got answered there. Uh, but I wanted to thank you very, very much for going further on uh, for, for coming today and, and giving this presentation. I mean, just like I said, tons of, of very helpful information. Um, and then I want to point the, the attendees out uh, in the chat there. There's a couple of great resources. Uh, whether it's the ncatech.org website, uh, specifically the Connected by Drone section, this webinar is being recorded and the presentation and the webinar will be available uh, at, that, uh, at that address there. 
And then I see Steven's got his email in the in the chat and Diana put in the SOSC email. Um, so Diana, if we can add in the, the FAA uh, UAS help in there uh, as well, uh, that'd be another great resource for folks. And then of course, on the ncatech.org website, there is forums there that you can ask any questions that you may have if, uh, if you don't wanna go you know, straight to the, the folks at the FAA. Uh, one caveat to that is you must be a member of the site in order to uh, post in the forums. You can look at the forums, uh, you cannot post unless you're actually a member. Um, and then I want to thank Diana and Alina in the background. I saw y'all just going to town answering questions for folks. And uh, Alina, you got anything to add here? Um, I guess just wanted to uh, shout out to our other program. Um, if anybody is working with schools or is part of a school, a collegiate higher education, then we have a program for you. Uh, it's called the UAS. CTI. It's also on NCAT's website if you want to take a look. Um, and Diana and I are happy to talk to you about joining. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any two-year, four-year schools uh, interested in being a part of CTI? Uh, Alina and Diana do a, a really great job onboarding folks and, and answering all their questions. Uh, if you're interested to see if a school near you is part of CTI, if you go to the ncatech.org uh, website, and you click on the, uh, the CTI, the, the UAS CTI, uh, it actually comes up with a map and lists all the schools that are part of it. Got a nice little map, tells about their programs and gives you hyperlinks directly to their program pages. So lots of great information there. Um, working on doing some of the same thing with the Connected by Drones folks, uh, but we're just getting started on that one. So we're not quite there yet, I don't think, uh, but that's something that we're continuously uh, working towards, so. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, Steve. This was a, a great uh, presentation, answered all the questions, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once again, Zach Nicklin with uh, the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, and this has been another installment of our Think Autonomous uh, web series. Uh, so go ahead and check out our page, check out our Facebook. Our, uh, we've got the links for, for the actual website in there and the resources and recordings should be available uh, between both of those sites. So uh, Steve, thank you once again uh, for, for coming and talking to us. Diana and, and Alina, thank you very much for your help setting this up. And I saw Scott uh, just jumped off the line there, but Scott was in the background uh, monitoring things and answering questions. So thank you very much too. Uh, to all our attendees, again, welcome. Thank you for coming and, and being a part of this. And please reach out with any further questions you may have.